Good evening, everyone. Greet me now. I say good evening, everyone. The Lord bless everyone tonight in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for this hour. We thank you because of this glorious day that we have development again. We're asking, Lord, that you touch your people tonight and empower your strength and your power and your spirit upon everyone in Jesus' name. You will anoint your children. Our brothers and sisters will be under a mighty anointing in Jesus' name. And Lord, none of us will miss out in Jesus' name. Bless us tonight as we examine the scriptures again. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. God bless you. We're coming to 1 Peter chapter 3. And I'm reading from verse 14. 1 Peter chapter 3. We're looking at verse 14. But, and if you suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror neither be troubled that one verse i've read to you in chapter three actually collects together summarizes together what you have in chapter one chapter two chapter three chapter four and chapter five peter the apostle has been talking about suffering and he tells us a christian will suffer suffer persecution a sage will suffer and the servants of God too will suffer because we are people of conviction and people of character. The world will not understand every way we go, will not understand every word we speak, will not understand every comportment we manifest. And because of that misunderstanding, they will persecute and we will suffer as a result of that persecution but you know as Christians and as the servants of God we're strengthened by the suffering we're not intimidated we're not afraid we're not coward we're not crushed that suffering brings strength unto us God's servant spread his own saving message we preach a life transforming gospel and this gospel converts sinners the gospel separates them from the world. And because the world is losing their committed sinners, the world will hate us for that. So the servants of God do suffer. You know what suffering does? It builds or it breaks. Suffering can build a man, can give us strength, can give us power can give us courage it can build us if you have the right attitude on the other hand suffering can break us down if we have the wrong attitude if we don't understand why is this happening to me why is that happening to me why are the people i thought will uh, congratulate me for a new life and for a new ministry why is it they are trying to crush me if you have the wrong attitude it will break you Persecution, suffering either builds or breaks. Persecution, suffering either braces you up or bruises you. It can bruise your uh, confidence and bru bruise your personality. If you take it the wrong way, if you take it the wrong right way, persecution and suffering will brace you up. Persecution may strengthen you or shatter you. Persecution may tear you apart shatter you batter you and destroy you on the other hand if you have the right attitude to persecution right attitude to suffering it will strengthen you it may develop you or destroy you when we talk of persecution persecution comes in various ways they can blackmail you they can write something terrible and uh, dirty about you. They can cast out your name as unprofitable. They can do a lot of things to you. Or it can be physical assault. Whatever it may be and whatever form it may take, it may develop you. You grow thick skin. 
you grow a strong backbone and you have a real vision foresight because of the persecution are you safe if i'm going to suffer for something let me really suffer for it and let me know why i'm suffering what i'm doing and what i ought to do if you don't have that attitude the suffering the persecution instead of developing you will destroy you but as uh, the apostle peter talks about persecution it surprises you that he goes in every chapter and he talks about this persecution i'm looking at chapter one i'm reading from verse six first peter chapter one verse six wherein ye greatly rejoice though now for a season if need be ye are in heaviness through manifold trials manifold temptations that the trial of your faith be much more precious than of gold that perishes though it be tried or fire might be found unto the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of jesus christ whom have you not seen ye love in whom do now ye see him not yet believing ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory receiving the end of your faith even the salvation of your soul in chapter one it talks about the persecution about the trial and about the suffering come to chapter 2 in chapter 2 i'm reading from verse 19. in verse 19 it says for this is thanksworthy if a man for conscience toward god endure grief suffering wrongfully it's like many christians and many servants of god and many preachers many pastors many teachers of the world they have not understood we can suffer wrongfully we think okay if i've done wrong i'm suffering i understand if i did something wrong and then i suffer for that and there is a problem there's a pressure upon me i understand but look at my life i'm saved i'm sanctified i'm serving god i've not done anything wrong i'm doing my very best i lay everything on the altar and yet i'm suffering look at verse 19 again for this is thankworthy if a man if a minister if a pastor for conscience toward god endure grief suffering wrongfully for what glory is it if when ye be buffeted for your faults, you take it patiently. But if when you do well and suffer for it, when you do well and suffer for it, when you minister well and suffer for it, when you preach well and suffer for it, when you live well and suffer for it, when you help people, support people, lead people up, when you evangelize well and you suffer for it, and you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. Look at chapter 3 verse 17 chapter 3 verse 17 for it is better if the will of god be so that she suffer for well doing than for evil doing persecution will come suffering will come and it is better if for well doing you suffer than for evil doing verse 18 for christ also has once suffered for sins the just for the unjust that he might bring us to god you see that the just for the unjust the savior for the sinners christ for us that he might bring us to god is that same kind of suffering that same kind of persecution we have today that we might bring sinners unto god if christ had to suffer if christ had to go through the pain so that he can bring humanity to the father the same thing with us as you're following christ and you're doing the work of god and bringing other people to know the lord suffering shame persecution pressure may come but you will stand somebody there i said you will stand then you look at that verse 18 for christ also hath once suffered for sins 
the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Come to chapter 4, verse 1. In chapter 4, verse 1, for as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, he suffered for us in the physical. He suffered for us. He was crucified. And before that crucifixion, stripes were laid upon him. Christ has suffered for us in the flesh. Arm yourself, equip yourself, fortify yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Look at verse 13. In verse 13 of that same chapter 4, but rejoice in as much as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering. You are partakers of Christ's suffering. He suffered for the salvation of humanity. You are partakers of the suffering of Christ for the salvation of others, for the maintainers of their salvation and for the steadiness in their salvation, for their steadfastness in their salvation, for them to remain stable and solid in their salvation. You labor for them, you suffer for them, and you bear reproach for them. The reproach that comes upon the minister is not for naught, it's not in vain, it's because you want sinners saved, you want saints to be steadfast, and you want steadfast saints to be filled with the Holy Ghost, and you want to prepare them for the very best they can do in the service of the Lord. That's why you suffer. That's why we suffer. And if you suffer for that sake, that's good, because it's a rewardable kind of suffering. Verse 13, but rejoice in as much as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as the murderer or as a thief or as an evil doer, or as a busy body in other men's matters, yet if any man suffer, yet if any minister suffer, yet if any preacher suffer, yet if any pastor suffer, yet if any child of God suffer, let him suffer as a Christian. Let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. Your suffering will glorify God. Your persecution will glorify God. And whatever suffering, whatever form it might take, it will bring glory to God and growth to the church and restoration for the backsliders and regeneration for sinners in Jesus' name. Chapter 5, I'm looking at verse 1. First Peter chapter 5 verse 1. The elders which are among you, I exhort, who am also an elder, listen to this, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, in the plural, a witness, I mean, partaker of this, that's what the Apostle Peter was saying, a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Look at verse 10. But the God of all grace, who has called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, you have been persecuted a while, and you have been a partaker of the sufferings of Christ a while for a little time. After ye have suffered a while, make you perfect. Amen. Establish, amen, strengthen, give me a good amen, and settle you. I'm talking tonight on the suffering that strengthens God's servants. The suffering that strengthens God's servants. 
Suffering will not shatter you. It will strengthen you. Suffering will not destroy you. It will develop you. Why is the amen so called tonight? Suffering will not break you. It will build you. Suffering will not bruise you. It will bruise you up. The suffering that strengthens God's servants. Three things we're looking at. Number one, the support of a good conscience in suffering. The support of a good conscience in suffering. Point number two, the strength of a godly character free from sinning. The strength of a godly character free from sinning. Point number three, the suffering for the great commission as good stewards. The suffering for the great commission as good stewards. We come to number one, the support of a good conscience while suffering. While you are suffering, you must have a clear conscience. This is not for sin. This is not for any evil I've done. This is not for any error. This is not for any kind of evil that could be found in my hand, in my tongue, in my life, or in my operations. That this is suffering for Christ. And you have a good conscience, a clear conscience. First Peter chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 16. First Peter chapter 3, verse 16. It says in chapter 3, verse 16 of First Peter, having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you, as of evil doers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse you, your good conversation in Christ. It talks about having a good conscience while you're suffering, while you're being persecuted. You check up on the inside. Don't just say, I'm suffering for Christ. I'm being persecuted for Christ. You check up. Why are you being persecuted? Verse 17, for it is better. If the will of God be so, that she suffer for well-doing. You have a good conscience, you are suffering for well-doing and not for evil doing. For Christ also, as one suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. The conscience is very important. And if the conscience is sensitive, and the conscience is, has not lost its sight, its voice, and its feeling, it will alert you when you are suffering and tell you whether you have a good conscience or an evil conscience. There are many types of conscience. Many types of conscience. Look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22. Hebrews chapter 10, Verse 22, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let's make sure that we're being to Calvary. We're being to Christ. And by the blood of Jesus, our heart with our conscience has been washed from an evil conscience. There's an evil conscience. There's a defiled conscience. In Titus chapter 1, reading from verse 15. Titus chapter 1, verse 15. Unto the pure, all things are pure. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. Conscience defiled. Make sure that you don't have a defiling character. 
a defiled conscience that you have been cleansed, you have been washed, you have been converted, and your conscience is not a defiled conscience. That's an accusing conscience. Romans chapter 2. I read from verse 15. Romans chapter 2, reading from verse 15, which show the work of the law, reaching in their hearts, their conscience also, bearing the witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile, accusing or else excusing one another accusing or else excusing when you are suffering your conscience might excuse you and say rest assured you're a child of god you know that they're persecuting you and you're suffering this because they do not understand the ways of the lord and don't change don't turn don't compromise don't bench don't bow to the persecutors because if you're benched, number one is like you're not sure of your own personal conviction. You're not sure of doing what you were doing. If you were doing something and you knew it was right, you knew it was the will of God, you knew this will be rewarded by God in heaven, you knew that this is the absolute truth that you can demonstrate if you are persecuted and you change, it means that you really were not sure. You didn't have conviction. And your conscience will then accuse you and say, look at that. It's like you're a hypocrite. But when you stand firm, that even though you have to endure this kind of suffering, you are going to stand. Then your conscience will excuse you and let you know that you are in the past. That is right. But on the other hand, if you were wrong, if you were evil, if you were sinful, if you were backsliding, if you were false, and then because of what you've done, you're being persecuted, your conscience will remind you, actually, you are at fault. Actually, you are not standing for Christ. And then your conscience will accuse you. That's an accusing a conscience there is a convicted conscience we're looking at john chapter 8 john chapter 8 and i'm reading from verse 9 john chapter 8 reading from verse 9 and they which heard it being convicted by their own conscience being convicted by their own conscience. They were accusing a woman that they caught that woman in the act of adultery. And they wanted to know from Jesus, what do you say? Moses said, such a woman should be stoned. And then we're waiting for you now, what you are going to say? And he said, he that has no sin among you, let him cast the first stone. When he thought about that, and their conscience aroused them and their conscience spoke within them they were convicted by their own conscience and they went out one by one beginning at the eldest even to the last beginning at the eldest even to the last there is an evil conscience there is a defiled conscience there is an accusing conscience. There is a convicted conscience. There is a seared conscience. We're looking at First Timothy chapter 4. First Timothy chapter 4. We're reading from verse 2. In First Timothy chapter 4, reading from verse 2, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. They started speaking lies. They didn't start their Christian lives that way, if they were ever Christians. But little by little, they were sliding, sliding back. That's what the backsliding means. Sliding away from the truth. Sliding away from the standard of the word of God. Standing away from a transparent lie. And as they were sliding and sliding, their conscience was alerting them, accusing them, 
convicting them and yet they kept on and kept on and kept on in that evil until the conscience is silenced until the conscience was not totally searched and the conscience could not speak again it says the speaking lies in hypocrisy having their conscience searched with a hot iron at salvation our hearts are converted at salvation our conscience is awakened past wrongs are made right a conscience to remind us now you say you are saved now you say you are born again how about what you have stolen how about the sins you have committed and you have hurt other people and our conscience will draw us and lead us to make restitution for the things that are wrong that we have done if your conscience doesn't do that it means that your conscience is deadened your conscience is seared and then you go on in sin and hypocrisy your salvation is at stake you really are not born again if you sin with impunity and you think you have immunity for sinning your conscience is seared but a person whose conscience is awakened he will make restitution and the conscience will now remain clear and clean as God's grace keeps that person living above sin, living free from sin. You'll have a clear conscience toward God and toward man. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 24, reading from verse 16, Acts chapter 24 verse 16 and herein do i exercise myself you understand the exercise that's what you do every time that's what you do regularly so that your limbs will not atrophy so that your body will be active and he says i exercise myself I investigate myself, I examine myself, I find out about my life, I'm taking inventory every time. Everything I've done from morning till this time, was that all right? Did I do that in good conscience? Every word I spoke, every action I took, every interaction I had, every report I gave, everything I've done, have I done everything in good conscience? Paul the Apostle said, I don't just go on galloping and trotting and you know the, the whole globe and preaching everywhere. I'm checking up on myself. I'm examining myself. He Herein do I exercise myself to have always, always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. Those kinds of preachers are the people that are conscious of heaven. And they are conscious, they really believe that Jesus can come at any time. And because of that, they want to keep a clear conscience. They want to keep a cleansed conscience. They want to keep a good conscience in every way they live. We're coming to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9, I read from verse 14. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14. How much more? shall the blood of christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to god purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living god to serve the living god if our service is going to be a service that is alive is service acceptable to God? Is service rendered to the living God? Our conscience must be purged. We must not be living day by day and day to day. Just jumping here, getting there, going into that uh, pitfall and getting into that, saying anything, acting anyhow, without our conscience approving that we're doing the right thing, we're going the right way, we're demonstrating uh, the proper life. It says our conscience must be purged by the blood of the Lamb. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, 
reading from verse 5. First Timothy chapter 1, we're looking at verse 5. It says in verse 5, it says, Now the end of the commandment, the purpose of the commandment, the goal of the commandment, the destination of the commandment, the reason why the commandment is given to us is charity, love, out of a pure heart, and a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. Good conscience. We we'll maintain that. That's the difference between a real evangelical minister, a real biblical minister, a real Pentecostal minister, and just a superficial minister, a religious person who has thrown away the conscience and is just acting superficially and religiously. A child of God, a real minister with a conscience that is purged, a conscience that is cleansed, will live by that good conscience, will face unfinished of pretending it tells us in romans chapter 9 romans chapter 9 i'm reading from verse 1 romans chapter 9 we're reading from verse 1 here is paul the apostle telling us about his own life and about his own inward disposition in romans chapter 9 verse 1 i say the truth in christ i lie not my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. There's a lot there. I say the truth, the truth in Christ. If Christ were to stand physically before me, what I'm saying now is exactly what I would say. The consciousness that Christ leads into every utterance that comes out of your mouth. The consciousness that Christ leads into every conversation you have in the private or in the public. The real understanding that the thought of your heart that preceded the words of your mouth is known to Christ. And then you say, I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. That's how to live. That anything you say, anywhere you are, you are living by that consciousness of the truth that you say in the Holy Ghost. Second Corinthians chapter 1. Second Corinthians chapter 1. Reading from verse 12. For our rejoicing is this. The testimony of our conscience. You see that Paul the Apostle says, This are rejoicing. Not only Paul now, but Timothy, or Silvano, Silas, and with all his co workers. He said, Corinthians, you know what? Our rejoicing is this the testimony of our conscience that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not worldly sincerity. I'm sincere, and then they begin to swear. I'm sincere, and then they begin to say, God sees me, and it's all a lie. This is not worldly sincerity. This is godly sincerity. Our rejoicing is this. The testimony of our conscience, that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, fleshly wisdom, human wisdom, worldly wisdom, carnal wisdom but by the grace of god we have had our conversation in the world and more abundantly to you world chapter 4 of second corinthians second corinthians chapter 4 i read from verse 2 but we have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty hidden although people may not know you are crafty you think you are clever it says we have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty not walking in craftiness nor handling the word of God deceitfully but by manifestation of the truth commending ourselves to every man's conscience 
commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Uh, you see, the New Testament makes a lot about the conscience. And if you're a New Testament believer, you also will make quite a deal a lot about your conscience. It tells us in uh, First Timothy chapter 1. First Timothy chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. First Timothy chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 19. It says in verse 19, holding faith and a good conscience. Timothy, keep on preaching, but take care of your conscience. Believers, ministers, servants of God, keep on ministering, but take care of your conscience. Holding faith and a good conscience, which some have put away concerning the faith and they have made shipwreck of their faith. When you thrust aside, when you throw away, when you neglect, when you trample upon your conscience and the conscience is no more active in your life, you are active but the conscience is not supporting you. You are moving, but the conscience is not moving along with you. When your conscience is thrown away, then you make shipwreck of the faith. You will not make shipwreck of your faith. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 3 verse 9. 1 Timothy chapter 3 verse 9. Holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. Not only that, I believe. Not only I accept the word, not only I'm earnestly contending for the faith, once delivered unto the saints, you hold that mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. And I pray that God will help every one of us as ministers of the gospel. We will stand and we will do everything we do with right conscience and pure conscience and good conscience in Jesus' name. Hebrews chapter 13, I'm reading from verse 18. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 18. Pray for us, for we trust we have a good conscience. We started with him, Paul the Apostle, in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 24, verse 16. Here do I exercise myself to always have a conscience, void of offense towards God and towards man. And here we come now, he's coming near to the end, to the end of his ministry, end of his life. And he says, I'm still checking up on my conscience. And it says, we trust, we have a good conscience in all things, willing to live honestly. Willing to live honestly. It says, I'm checking up every time. And I pray you'll be checking up every time. Amen, amen. amen. Point number two now, the strength of a godly character free from sinning. The strength of a godly character free from sinning. We're coming back to First Peter chapter 4. And I read from verse 1. First Peter chapter 4, verse 1. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourself, fortify yourself. Put on the armor, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. It's not talking about the believer. That Christ suffered for us to purchase salvation for us. And if we have followed him and identified with him, he that has suffered in the flesh, if you're suffering persecution, it means that you really want to totally clear your life so that you will not suffer in vain. That he no longer should leave the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. For the time past of our life, may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lost past tense, 
excess of wine in the past life, revelings in the past life, banquetings in the past life, and abominable idolatries. Wherein they think it's strange that she run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. The people in our communities are other religious people. They think it's strange what we preach, what we utter, what we proclaim, how we live, how we stand clean and clear from all the pollutions of the world. Those other people that see our lives, they think it's strange and they speak evil of us. Who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead? You'll be free from sin. Your life will be free from sinning. Give a good, good amen. amen. Psalm 4. We're looking at verses 3 and 4. Psalm 4. The book of Psalms. Psalm 4. We're looking at verses 3 and 4. It says, But know that the Lord has set apart him that is godly for himself. If you are saved by grace and you have this salvation from Christ, the Lord sets you apart not for the world. The Lord sets you apart not for the entertainers of the world. The Lord sets you apart, not for any of the things they're doing in the world. He sets you apart for himself. The Lord will hear when I call unto him. Verse 4, stand in awe and sin not. You're set apart. You're godly. The grace of God has come to your life and you're looking at your life and you're examining your life and you're making sure that you are totally, entirely, completely for the glory of God set apart unto God. It says you're standing on and see not commune with your own heart upon your bed and be still. Let's come to Exodus chapter 20 i'm reading from verse 20 exodus chapter 20 and i'm reading from verse 20 it says in verse 20 and moses said unto the people fear not for god is come to prove you and that his fear may be before your faces that ye sin not. That's the standard of God. He said he called the Israelites as a peculiar people. He called them unto himself. And he said they should fear him so that they will not sin. You will not sin. In the private, you will not sin. In the public, you will not see. You know, those who see, they don't believe in God. You say, what? Yes, they don't believe in God. If they believe that God is everywhere present, and God is seeing them now, and God is recording everything they do or miss, and God observes them. If they believe that God can see everything and see through everything, they're not seeing. You cannot commit adultery with a woman in the presence of her husband. If it's when the husband is far away and the husband will not see you, that's when you try to commit adultery with a woman. Now, God is never far away. He's always there. If you do anything wrong 
and you do it thinking that God does not see, you don't believe in God. When you believe in God and you know that God sees everything and God is going to bring everything to judgment. If you don't repent, you will not be living your life carelessly and sinning and doing just anything. He wants you to fear him that you sin not. Let's look at Psalm 39 verse 1. Psalm 39 verse 1. I said, I will take heed to my ways that I sin not with my tongue. I said, I'm going to take heed to my way. I know God sees me at all times. And I know that God knows everything that I do. And he's going to bring everything to judgment. And therefore, I made up my mind. And I said, I will take it to my ways that I sin not waste my tongue. I will keep my mouth with a bridle while the wicked is before me. Psalm 119. Psalm 119. I'm reading from verse 1, Psalm 119, reading from verse 1. It says in verse 1, Blessed are the undefiled in the way, who walk in the law of the Lord. Verse 3, they also do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. They do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. Verse 11, Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. That's a real believer. That's a real child of God. He loves God. And because he loves God, he doesn't want to do anything any time that will offend God. And he knows God is always there. God is always there. If you love God, and you know God is there, and you know that if you do this, he will see it, it will grieve him. Whether you are in the house of God, or you are in your office, or you are at home, or you are on the street, or you are in a bus, or you are in a taxi, or you are in the plane, anywhere you are, whether you are called uh, to take part in some activities of the nation or to just take part in activities of your local little family, you will not sin, you will not do anything wrong if you love God. It's like, um, you know, your wife saying, I love my husband, I love my husband, I love my husband. And the presence of that husband, he will, she will do something that she knows the husband will be unhappy about. She doesn't love the husband. He just talk of mouth. If you love God, God is always there. And because he's always there, you love him, you will not do any sin that will make him unhappy, that will grieve him. We're coming to John chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 14. John chapter 5, verse 14. The strength of the godly character that is lived free from sin. John chapter 5, I read from verse 14. Afterward, Jesus findeth him in the temple and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole, sin no more. Christ does not give us license to go and sin. Christ does not give us license to behave anyhow. That grace may abound, then we continue in sin. Never. He wants us to live free from sin and to love the Lord and show that love by living a life that is righteous and free from sin or sinning. It tells, uh, it tells us in this word, Behold, thou art made whole, sin no more, lest he was sin come on thee. Chapter 8, verse 11. John 8, verse 11. She said, No man, Lord. Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn you. I came to show compassion. And I came to get you into conversion. But now, after forgiveness, now, after conversion, 
Now, after condemnation has passed away, go and sin no more. Help me shout that out. Go and sin no more. Help me say that again. Look at your brother, look at your sister by your side, don't dodge. Look at them face to face and say, go and see no more. God confirmed that in Jesus' name. We're looking at Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, I read from verse 2. Romans chapter 6, reading from verse 2. God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein look at verse 6 knowing this that our old man is crucified what's he that the body of sin might be destroyed that henceforth we should not serve sin henceforth from this day, from this date, from this time, from the time we have made Christ, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead, dead with Christ, is freed from sin. Thank God you are free. I say, thank God you are free. Verse 11, likewise, Reckon ye yourself also to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye may obey it in the laws thereof. It tells us in verse 18. Verse 18, being then made free from sin. That's a child of God. That's a convert. That's a real Bible believer. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. Verse 22, but now be made free from sin and become servants to God. Ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life first corinthians chapter 15 first corinthians chapter 15 i read from verse 33 first corinthians chapter 15 verse 33 be not deceived evil communications corrupt good manners after hearing the word of god if you go into evil communication erroneous communication contrary communication contrary to the word of god you are hearing that will prepare you to be ready at the time of the rapture if you continue in that evil communication even with yourself communing with yourself but evil you will not be free from sin and if the rapture happens any time, you are left behind, you are lost. Verse 34, awake to righteousness and sin not. Awake to righteousness. Awake to obedience. Awake to holiness. We're hearing it over and over and we're hearing it often. Wake up and understand why you are a minister in the church and why you are a member of the church awake to righteousness and say not for some have not the knowledge of god i speak this to your shame it tells us in first john chapter three first john chapter three and i read from verse eight first john chapter three Reading from verse 8, He that committeth sin is of the devil. A person who claims to be born again, a person who claims to be a minister of God, a person who claims to love God, a person who claims to believe the Bible, a person who claims to stand in a sound doctrine, a person who claims to be earnestly contending for the faith, once delivered unto the saints. If he commits sin, 
whatever his testimony and whatever his bragging, whatever his position, he that committed sin is of the devil. For the devil sinned from the beginning for this purpose. The Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Amen. Whosoever is born of God, tell me, say it aloud. Whosoever is born of God, say it now, does not commit sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Verse 10, in this the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of god neither he that loveth not is brother i pray god will keep you free from sin anytime every time anywhere everywhere in jesus name first john chapter 5 verse 18 First John chapter 5 verse 18 We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not Here John the beloved an apostle he said this is open secret we know everybody who has been to Christ everybody who has the grace of Christ we all know this. He says, we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. He will not touch you. And he cannot force you. Since you are born again, Satan cannot force you to sin. The world cannot force you to see. Nobody can force you to see. You know, some people say, I'm innocent. I have a good mind. I want to live right. But my manager makes me to see. Uh -uh. You wanted to see. You wanted to keep that job and lose your soul. My director made me to see. No, no. You wanted to see him. You wanted to keep the good favor you have with the director. And you want to throw away your salvation and your soul. That's why you see him. Madame made me to see him. No, no. You wanted to see him. Already your own lust was drawing you. Before Madame requested of you like Potiphar's wife to commit sin. You wanted to do it. You will not sin anymore. Come back to ch that chapter 5, verse 18. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. He will not touch me. Say it for yourself. He will not touch me. And you cannot lose your job if God has that job for you. I will not lose my job. You will not lose your property if God means that property for you. I will not lose my property. Not everybody is talking. You cannot die before your time. I will not die before my time. Abraham didn't die before his time. I will not die before my time. Moses did not die before his time. I will not die before my time. And those worthies of old who served the Lord, they didn't die until they finished everything God ordained for them to do. Don't fear death. Death is not on your path. A thousand might fall by your side, and ten thousand on the other side. Only with your eyes will you behold and see the reward of the wicked. With long life will it satisfy you. Long life. Who is that? 
is confirmed in Jesus' name. Don't fear this. Don't fear this. Don't fear this. Christ has taken the sting of death away. You will live. I will live. The Lord confirm it in Jesus' name. Point number three now. Our suffering for the great commission as good stewards. We're coming back to First Peter chapter 4. First Peter chapter 4. I'm reading here from verse 10 and verse 11. First Peter chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 10. As every man has received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifest grace of God. Minister as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If any man speak in soul winning, if any man speak in evangelism, if any man speak in preaching, if any man speak on the crusade field, if any man speak as a preaching pastor, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability God gives, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. But you know, in that preaching, in that ministry, in that ministration, suffering may come. Persecution may come. Some people have got converted and they find out who is the source of that conversion. And they are angry against you. You have not wronged them. You have actually done something good for their family. Helping one of the members of their family who would have perished to come to life eternal. And because of that, they persecute. Look at what it says in verse 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the very trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. You are helping other people to grow in their Christian life. You're doing the follow-up. And then you enter to that house and you say, I'm looking for so-and-so. Why? What have you going to do with him? He's not a member of your church. Don't come here again. And uh, you say, please, uh, let me talk to him. He's my friend and all that. And then you go in, uh, pull out the Bible and talk Bible and talk uh, standing firm on your newfound face and desire the sincere milk of the world that she may grow thereby. 30 minutes, you are still there. One hour, you are still there. And that a man came along and said, are you still there? What are you doing there? I will deal with you if you are not careful. And calmly, you say, I just bring good news unto you. Sir, you know, Jesus Christ died for us. And he died for you. He's surprised that although he's angry against you, you are calm, you are cool, you are courageous, and you are sharing the gospel with him. God will give you that stamina. He will give you that backbone. You will stand and declare the word of the Lord without fear, without favor, in Jesus' name. And if they speak anything against you or persecute you, that persecution will not move you. Suffering will not make you abandon the great commission in Jesus' name. But such in, but rejoice in as much as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, that ye may be glad also ways exceeding joy if ye be reproached for the name of christ happy are ye you'll be happy for the spirit of glory 
and of God rests upon you. On their part, he is evil spoken of, but on your part is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, a dinner, and a betting abortion, or killing lives, or being involved in anything dangerous to anybody's life. Let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. But if any man suffer, if any brother suffer, if any sister suffer, if any minister suffer, as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it falls begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous castly be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let him that suffer your suffering persecution. Wherefore, let him that suffer your suffering wrongfully. Wherefore, let him that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well doing as unto a faithful creator. The Lord will keep you. He will not allow any suffering to come beyond that which you can bear. He'll take care of you. The Lord will take care of me. The Lord will take care of me. The Lord will take care of me. He will take care of you. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Nothing evil will happen to you. Whatever they do will strengthen you. Will give you a good, strong backbone in Jesus' name. You know what Nebuchadnezzar tried to do against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Strengthen them. They went into that fire and they came out with a testimony. You always come out with a testimony in Jesus' name. Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8, verse 35. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. Just so uh, extra careful, hyper careful, ultra careful. You will not go out. We don't know what will happen because of the condition of the state and the condition of the communities. I don't think I want to go out. Whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospel's sake, the same shall save it. Your life is secured. Your life is protected. For what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What shall he profit us if we gain the whole world and we lose the souls of our community, the souls of the people around us, and we're not preaching to them. Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father or the holy angels. You will not be ashamed. Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6, reading from verse 22. Luke chapter 6, verse 22. Blessed are ye. When men shall hate you, that's what some people cannot stand. They cannot stand Pharaoh frowning at them. They cannot stand Nebuchadnezzar getting angry at them. 
They cannot stand Herod pointing finger and say, be careful, be careful. If you do that again, they cannot stand a mortal man, a mortal woman frowning at them. And because of that, they're shivering all that man fiery spirit be cast away from your heart in jesus name blessed are ye when men shall hate you and when they shall separate you from their company and they shall reproach you and cast out your name as evil they mention your name they make a caricature of your name they turn your name upside down they deliberately make your name evil they cast out your name as evil for the son of man's sake verse 23 cry verse 23 weep verse 23 lock up yourself in your house verse 23 wear black suit so you can mourn Tell me, tell me, tell me, say it aloud, rejoice ye in that day. If your pastor is ridiculed, you mourn and then you don't come to church again, tell me. No, you come to church, you come to church, you see, you recognize our pastor as somebody different, distinct that will speak the word of God, he'll read the Bible, he'll give the interpretation, and they don't understand the interpretation. And so they throw his name overboard, and they say, that is evil. No, we don't cry because of that. Rejoice, rejoice ye in that day, and leap for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven. I have reward waiting for me in heaven. Somebody there, I have reward waiting for me in heaven. It says, for your reward is great in heaven. For in the like manner did their fathers to the prophets. Verse 24, but woe unto you that are rich. For ye have received your consolation. Woe unto you that are full. For ye shall, shall hunger, woe unto you that laugh now. For ye shall mourn and weep. Look at this, look at this, verse 26. Woe unto you when, tell me, woe unto you when, say it aloud, woe unto you when all men shall speak well of you. For so did their fathers to the false prophets. You will not be a false prophet. You will stand firm, courageous, having backbone. You preach the word of God. You will not be afraid in Jesus' name. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. I read from verse 24. Colossians chapter 1, verse 24. Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you. Paul the Apostle said, No, we're not ashamed. No, we're not coward. No, we're not conquered. No, we're not sorrowful. No, we're not hiding in a room, not wanting to do the work of God again. Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for the body's sake which is the church you keep on rejoicing and whatever challenge may come you'll keep on glorifying the lord and walking for god in jesus name acts chapter 20 i read from verse 23 acts chapter 20 reading from verse 23 Save, except that the Holy Ghost witnesses in every city, saying that burns and afflictions abide me. The burns and afflictions await me. 
but none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course of joy. You'll finish with joy. You'll finish with courage. You'll finish with boldness. You'll finish with success. You'll finish with more fruit into the kingdom in Jesus' name, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify of the gospel of the grace of God. Keep on testifying, keep on preaching, and keep on proclaiming the gospel which is to save souls. Great will be your reward here on earth and also in heaven in Jesus' name. Romans chapter 1, Romans chapter 1, verse 14. Romans chapter 1, verse 14. I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So, as much as in me is, I am ready. Are you ready? I am ready. I said, are you ready? I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The Lord will make this word powerful in your mouth in Jesus' name. You will preach. Souls will come to the Lord. You tell them to turn away from sin. You tell them to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And you tell them as they believe, salvation will come to them. Romans chapter 10, verse 9. Romans chapter 10, reading from verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. You emphasize Christ, his sacrifice. You emphasize Christ, his death. You emphasize Christ, is salvation and you emphasize Christ is lordship you emphasize the fact that there's no other name given among men whereby we must be saved he died for us he rose again for justification and as many as will come to him believing on him accepting him as lord of their lives they will be saved for what they had man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation for the scripture says whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed for there is no difference between the jew and the greek for the same lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. I'm waiting for your amen. amen. For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord, shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Any preacher there? Sisters, I said any preacher there? Brothers, I said any preacher there? Are you going to make use of your gift of preaching tomorrow? It will happen. How will they hear about the Savior without a preacher? In verse 15, how shall they preach except they be saved? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But 
they have not all obeyed the gospel. It's not, he said, they have not all. Some have obeyed, as for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report, so then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Can we read that together? One, two, three, go. Faith to be saved comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. I see multitudes coming to Christ through you. I see multitudes coming into the kingdom through you. I want to see you in action. I said I want to see you in action. What are you? Active brother. Rise up now. Active sister. Great things will happen in Jesus' name. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord. Forget about the suffering. Forget about the persecution. Everything that comes, anything that comes, you will bear. You will stand. You'll not be a coward. You'll stand for the Lord. You'll stand in the gospel. You'll stand in the power of the Lord. Open your mouth and say, Lord, I'm going to do it. Henceforth, henceforth, no more sinning. Henceforth, there is no more shame. Henceforth, there's no more cowardice. Henceforth, there is courage. Henceforth, there's conviction. Henceforth, I'm going to do what you have called me to do. Henceforth, I'm going to be an agent of change. And I'm going to bring many into your kingdom as I'm standing, my converse will stand. My converse courageously will stand in every situation and you will not yield to the oppressor or persecutor. Open your mouth and let courage, greater courage, come into you today.